Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our WESC webinars. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Josie Fries, and I am WESC's Marketing Advisor. For those who aren't familiar with WESC, we, we empower female entrepreneurs to start, grow, and scale their businesses. We have a ton of different services to help you on your journey, including business advising, financing, events, and training. Right now, we're offering free webinars every Wednesday on a variety of different business topics. So be sure to check those out on our website at wesk.ca slash events. Today, our topic is building an IP strategy for your business and is presented by Marnie Fighton, IP advisor from the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. If you have any questions for Marnie as we go through the presentation today, please submit them in that Q&A box, not the regular chat box but feel free to use that regular chat box to share with us kind of who you are, uh, where you come from, what your business is, we'd love to hear more about you. And as always, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And you'll also receive an email tomorrow at this time with a link to the recording. Okay, thanks Marnie for facilitating this webinar today and please begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, everyone. I'll just take a quick moment here to share my screen. And then we'll get started. Love technology on the spot. Alrighty. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Marnie Fighton, and I'm one of seven intellectual property advisors with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, or CIPO. And I cover the three Prairie Provinces and the Northwest Territories uh, based in Edmonton. So I normally travel a fair bit, but I'm starting to like this digital outreach um, style because I have access to audiences that I, I wouldn't always be able to, uh, to speak with in this way. Um, also, um, it is Innovation Week here across Canada, and as I'm sure you know, tomorrow is Women's Entrepreneurship Day, so kudos uh, to all of you for running, starting, or considering starting a business. You truly are the engines of, uh, of the economy. So if I could ask everyone to type a few words in the chat about what kind of business you're in, and I'll try to emphasize content that may be uh, relevant for you. And if there's any registered patent or trademark agents or other IP professionals in the audience, if you could also just mention in chat uh, which areas of IP and which technology um, areas and markets that you specialize in. So I have 26 uh, slides to go through, a uh, fair bit of content, but um, this deck is loaded with hot links and uh, links to, to little videos. So if I need to skip ahead to make up time, or if, if I lose my internet connection, which has happened, um, this deck will be distributed afterwards and you'll be able to go through and click on the decks. <clears throat> there we go. So my goal today is to equip you with a foundation to recognize the main forms of IP, and then to apply that, to identify the IP that's key to your competitive advantage. I'll also provide an introduction to developing an IP strategy specific to your business, your budget, and the attributes of your innovations as part of your overall business plan. So uh, CIPO is a Government of Canada agency responsible for the administration of IP rights in Canada rights like granting patents and maintaining the official register of registered trademarks. Although um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, part of Agriculture Canada, uh, they administer plant breeders' rights. So CIPO's mandate includes five areas. The IP advisors like myself focus on the third one where you see the little green hat. We work to raise awareness of the value of IP and we help small businesses make effective use of it. Uh, I should also say we don't give legal advice or funding of any kind, unfortunately, uh, but we do help entrepreneurs learn the basics about IP and equip them to make informed and strategic decisions on how to protect, use, and how to get the most return from your investments in innovation uh, 
and your IP. And the best news is my information guidance and uh, resources, it's, it's free to entrepreneurs as a public service. So I'm, I'm not here today to, to try and tell you anything. So let's start with why you should care about IP. Uh, in 2019, around 90% of the value of companies on the S&P 500 was from their ownership of intangibles, uh, things like their intellectual property and data. This is up from 80% 15 years ago. And back in 1985, which isn't really all that long ago, it was just 30%. So the value of intangibles like IP has shot up from 30 to 90% in 35 years. Uh, in Canada, it's around 70% of the TSX are intangibles. Now, another reason IP matters is that taking stock of your IP and also your competitors, uh, this can help you avoid costly mistakes. Uh, and understanding the competitive landscape from an IP perspective can stop you from investing money and effort on products or services you don't have the rights to. In a situation like that, you could be forced to stop making, using, or selling infringing articles and could be ordered by a court to pay uh, substantial monetary penalties. So the takeaway here is that IP infringement can cripple or destroy a business, particularly if your competition happens to be among the big players with deep pockets to pay uh, lawyers to protect their freedom to operate and to expand it. On the flip side of that, understanding your competitor's IP can also help identify gaps in the marketplace, which could be a niche for you to go in and fill, and opportunities to partner and collaborate with other firms. You can also learn about your competitors and which of their employees are the key innovators. Making strategic use of IP can also position you to have um, productive conversations with uh, potential investors. Lastly, IP can create revenue streams if you decide to uh, license or sell your IP. So here are the main forms of IP and the hyperlink at the top takes you to our YouTube channel. And that's where you'll find a series of short clips on each type along with introductory info on commercializing IP, enforcing IP rights and doing business abroad, but don't go there yet. Uh, I normally take an hour just to go through, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the five main types of IP. But today I'll just give a very high level overview and we have on-demand e-learning modules that are excellent and go into more detail. <clears throat> okay, so first we're gonna look at uh, trademarks. <clears throat> These are what drive brand recognition by helping competitors recognize products and services from one firm. Excuse me, I'm just gonna mute myself and All right. So trademarks are what help distinguish your goods or services from others in the marketplace. And a trademark can be words, numbers, designs, logos, slogans. It can even be a three-dimensional shape, a jingle or sounds, or any combination of all of those things. So when a trademark is registered with CEPO, this gives the owner exclusive use, exclusive right to use that trademark in association with your specific uh, products or services across Canada for 10 years. And important to know that um, trademarks can be renewed every 10 years. And the goodwill value of your trademarks in accounting terms will only increase the more you use it and the more your customers identify with it and stick to your brand. So looking at the next bullet about the Madrid system, Canada is a member of this international treaty. And what it does is streamline registering trademarks in multiple jurisdictions. So firms can build their brand both at home and, their, and in their export markets. <clears throat> um, so as I go through the types of IP, you'll see examples of Canadian companies like uh, Tim Hortons and Shopify. <clears throat> you'll see that they use the symbol for a registered trademark, the R inside of a circle. Whereas Triple Kick, and this is a nitrogen management product, 
by Saskatchewan-based Northern Nutrients. Uh, they, they use the TM mark, and that indicates an unregistered trademark. And these do have some protection under common law in local markets where your clients recognize your marks. So uh, Northern Nutrients has applied to register their mark. So once it is, they can use the R inside of a circle if, if they choose to. <clears throat> so next we'll look at the patent. The example here is related to carbon, ca carbon capture and the patent was granted to carbon engineering out of BC in 2017. Uh, by the way, when you see the video clip logo in the deck that takes you uh, to a YouTube clip. So patents are for products, processes, machines, chemical compositions, or improvements or new uses to an existing invention that must meet three requirements. To get a patent, it's gotta be new, and that means a first to the world, not just uh, first in Canada. It's gotta be useful. In other words, it solves some problem in a practical way, and it has to be not obvious. In other words, something not apparent to a person with ordinary skills in the field of the invention. So a patent allows the holder to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing uh, their patented invention. And that can be a very effective barrier to entry for competitors. If you apply for a patent in Canada, after a process of examination by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office or CIPO, a patent may be granted with a duration of up to 20 years from the date the application is filed. Alternatively, if they find the invention is not new, useful, and non-obvious, it likely would be rejected. So part of the application process requires the person applying to completely and fully disclose the invention, including how, it, how to make it and how it operates. And that information is made public 18 months after a patent application is filed. So if you have an invention that involves an important element that is currently a trade secret, you'll want to carefully consider your options and the timing of how you go about protecting that if you plan to apply for a patent, uh, keeping in mind that patents are awarded on a first to file basis. So one approach uh, you could take to decide whether, whether, when, and in which countries to apply for a patent is to estimate the cost of obtaining as well as maintaining and enforcing each patent. Then weigh those costs against your estimated revenues in each market to ensure that you'll recoup money invested in patenting and of course turn a profit. So a quick word about grace periods. An invention should not have been disclosed to the public before an application is filed or it will be considered in the public domain or what is known as prior art, as opposed to being new. There's an exception to this rule in Canada and some other countries, including the United States. The inventor may file an application up to 12 months after they first disclose the invention without losing rights in those countries. But before disclosing your invention with the intention to take advantage of that grace period, be careful that it does come with a risk you may not be able to obtain patent protection in countries that have a six month grace period or countries that require absolute novelty. In other words, they have no grace period. So consider that point about timing of disclosures carefully if you wanna apply for a patent in Europe or certain Asian markets. Uh, Canada is a member of the Patent Cooperation Treaty or PCT, which is an international filing mechanism that simplifies applying for a patent in numerous countries. So in, in general, if you want patent protection in three or more countries, the PCT route is very worth looking at. Uh, a good example of a company that leveraged that PCT route and in doing so delayed their filing and legal costs as long as possible uh, is our IP success story on Solus Power. There's a lot of embedded know-how in the story uh, so take a look if you have a chance. The last point on the slide is acknowledging many businesses wonder whether to file a patent application or to safeguard their invention as a trade secret, uh, particularly for pre-revenue startups. And the reference at the bottom is a good resource to help you in that um, decision. 
So moving now on to uh, copyrights. So copyright is what protects creative original works that are literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic in nature, such as a book, a play, film, a music composition, painting, or sculpture. And copyright gives the owner the rights to reproduce the work it protects and the right to publish, translate, and to perform it. A uh, quick note on IP and software, which is subject to copyright as a literary work. Uh, for example, North Star Systems out of Saskatoon has registered their software copyrights. And copyright is generally recognized globally. So for example, if you created the content, content or images on your website in Canada, most countries recognize your copyrights. As for duration, uh, copyright currently lasts for the life of the creator plus 50 years in Canada. So now uh, moving on to trade secrets. So this is something confidential that has commercial value. Um, a well-known example is the formula for Coca-Cola. Other examples of business info that can be valuable if kept secret include processes or methods of production, customer and supplier lists, your pricing strategies, sales information, and more and more these days, data holdings. Uh, there's no application or registration process for trade secrets in Canada, which means there's no formal rights. So a business needs to, to guard their trade secrets closely, including how they handle information with their business partners, their investors, employees, and contractors. We recommend entrepreneurs implement certain business practices and uh, systems to protect the full value of any trade secrets. This is in case you end up in court one day so you can demonstrate that you took reasonable steps to protect valuable secrets. I've embedded links to a few articles for more information on this and also see the six tips uh, in CIPO's trade secret fact sheet, uh, which you can reach through clicking on the, the link at the top. If you do have trade secrets or early versions of designs, machines, software code, or really anything that you can store in a digital format, have a look at the new WIPO proof service. Uh, this is through the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, WIPO. So for around $40 Canadian, you can get verifiable evidence that a given digital file existed and it was in your possession on a given date sort of an, an insurance policy. Now looking at industrial designs. So this is perhaps the most underutilized of all kinds of IP, but this is changing. Worldwide, the use of industrial designs or IDs has doubled since 2005. In the US, industrial designs are called design patents. So these are not about how something works, it's about something's novel aesthetic or the visual appeal. If something has a unique appearance um, due to its shape, configuration, its pattern or or ornamentation or any combination of those things. The example here is from Levin and this is an Edmonton based company and a combination of two registered industrial designs, a light switch, which is like a remote control and a load controller that controls the power to their device. So when you register an industrial design in Canada, you have the exclusive right to use, sell, and manufacture that design for up to 15 years. Similar to patents and trademarks, industrial design rights are territorial in nature. So you should register in each country that you plan to do business. And the Hague uh, International Filing System is one way to uh, apply for an industrial design in many uh, jurisdictions. Now looking at plant breeders rights. So these are a form of IP uh, by which new plant varieties, in other words, not heritage varieties, but new varieties of plants can be protected in a similar way that an invention can be protected with a patent. Uh, just in the last year, 23 new varieties of canola have been registered as plant breeders rights. So the CFIA administers the Plant Breeders Rights Act, which governs registrations. 
uh, once granted, PBRs give the exclusive rights to propagating material for the new plant variety. These rights last for up to 25 years in the case of a variety of tree and vine, and 20 years for all other varieties of plants. The breeder maintains their rights by paying an annual fee. So for more information on what qualifies as a new variety, uh, click on the link at the top and it'll take you to the fact sheet. So moving on from the, uh, the drier material of uh, the, the main forms of IP, let's take a look at the top three IP mistakes that can be detrimental to business success. So the number one mistake is thinking about your IP too late. And that's, that's what the, the face palm is all about. It's really vital to identify the IP that's important to your competitive advantage and to take steps to ensure you own it, or at the very least have permission or license to use it if it belongs to someone else. The importance of this magnifies if you do business outside Canada. And yes, this includes over the internet. Or if you manufacture or assemble abroad, um, think about your IP sooner than later. So a great way to mitigate this risk is to develop an IP strategy and revisit how you implement it as your business grows. I'll give you all a link to CPO's interactive IP strategy planning tool a bit later to get you started and to help you avoid that, uh, that first most common mistake. So uh, the second thing is assuming that IP rights, rules and procedures are the same everywhere, but there are differences and uh, peculiarities in each country which arise from national laws, regulations, and court decisions. So it's important to know that a granted patent, for example, is, o is only good in that uh, country. Ah, so the second mistake is assuming that IP rights, rules, and procedures are the same everywhere. Okay, I already went over that, let's move ahead. Um, so I've, I've mentioned the international uh, IP filing systems available for patents, trademarks, and industrial designs. And we do uh, strongly recommend working with a registered Canadian patent or trademark agent or other IP professional with experience, um, both in your area of technology and innovation and in obtaining IP rights and enforcing those rights in your target markets. I'm gonna just take a quick moment to look in the chat box. See what's shaking. Nothing in Q and A yet. I know there's a way to look at chat. If you're Sorry. sharing your screen, Marnie, maybe you have to just click. There's the three dots. The more sometimes it hides when you're sharing your screen. Ah, so if you can yep. find those three dots, you'll probably see chat under that menu there. I did find it. Perfect. But rather than keep people waiting, I'll move on to the next slide. So um, the third common IP mistake, think of this scenario. You've got a fabulous idea for a new venture. You've got a rough business plan or a lean canvas, and you're really excited to launch it and, and get some sales. But you need cash to get started. So you approach angel investors, family, and friends and naturally they're excited too. And they want details about your technology or your product or service solution. The IP mistake that you could fall into in this scenario is disclosing too much information too soon or to the wrong people. So as much as it is tempting to reveal confidential details um, to potential investors, manufacturers, distributors, people at trade shows, or if you're in a Kickstarter campaign, but let's look at the risk that entails and why it's smart to minimize what you say and to whom you disclose information before you file applications to formally protect your IP and implement those business systems that will safeguard uh, any trade secrets. So failure to do so exposes you to the risk that copycats can steal, make and sell your product or uh, steal your trade names and trademarks and sell inferior goods and services with it. Uh, so disclosing information can also prevent you from getting a patent or an industrial design registration if that's the direction you, you decide to go later. 
So most countries have a first to file patent system rather than a first to invent. What that means is even if you can prove you were the first to have an idea of an invention, you could lose the race if a competitor hears about it and files before you. So the best practice in this situation is to talk about what your invention can do, but not the specifics of exactly how. With any kind of enabling details, you want to assess and define what you actually need to disclose. And you do so on a strict need to know basis. And that's after establishing confidentiality contracts or non-disclosure agreements with your employees, any contractors, partners, investors, et cetera. And you may very well find that some investors, for example, are hesitant to sign an NDA. So again, talk about what your technology can do, not exactly how. And, and just consider the risks of disclosing too much information too soon. You may want to practice a non-confidential pitch so that you'll be, you'll be prepared if you're approached by someone wanting more information than they really need to know. Uh, finally, quick note that unfortunately, employees are the ones most likely to disclose valuable trade secrets, either inadvertently or purposely. So segment your business confidential information and limit and control access to it to only the employees who need it to carry out their duties and ensure they know the consequences of leaking any secrets, both while they work for you and after they leave. Um, an, exit, an exit interview can be a good reminder of this and uh, keep, uh, keep a record of those interviews. Okay, so now we're gonna move on uh, to getting you started developing an IP strategy specific to your business. Okay, well, we're doing pretty good for time here. So a fundamental question uh, for any business is the nuts and bolts of exactly how you plan to effectively commercialize your innovations and it related intellectual property. So consider the options by asking yourself if you wanna make and sell the product within your firm, or do you wanna license or franchise it to a third party or maybe several third parties for them to make and sell on your behalf in exchange for royalties, a percentage of revenue or profits or some other arrangement. Or maybe you wanna sell the IP to a third party outright. Maybe you're looking to exit completely and sell the whole business. A strong IP position can help attract offers. So first I'll just mention it's critical for innovative firms wanting to scale or export uh, to have a base of knowledge around IP and a robust IP strategy consistent with your overall business plan. Because IP that's not fully utilized, it's a, it's a missed opportunity to grow and to compete globally. Now, if there could be only two uh, takeaways from this whole hour, please let it be the following points that a patent strategy is not an IP strategy. And that just because you can patent doesn't mean you should. I know sacrilegious, but there, there's logic to it. So a patent can be part of an IP strategy if you have a patentable invention and a long enough product life cycle that patenting makes sense for you. But be sure that you consider all forms of IP and build a complete strategy to take maximum advantage and valuation of all your intangible assets. So an IP strategy, it's essentially a set of decisions around what, where, and when to protect the IP that gives you your competitive advantage, as well as how you'll monitor the marketplace to know if your IP rights are being infringed and to keep an eye on what competitors are up to. Having a solid IP strategy uh, consistent with your overall business plan, it helps you solidify your commercialization plans and the path you're gonna take to help achieve your business goals with your IP. So this means having visibility in your financials of the resources you need to invest in IP to grow your market share and also to enforce your rights. And visibility of those things helps justify your projected revenues. So having a strategy that shows consideration of all forms of IP and including why you may decide not to pursue one form or another at your particular stage of business. Uh, that can be very attractive to astute investors. 
Uh, next, as a, as a risk management tool, deciding which IP you want to protect formally in each of your target markets and searching the prior art of existing uh, IP databases and academic literature. This will help establish your competitive position. And uh, it'll also help you avoid the very costly mistake of unintentionally infringing someone else's IP rights. You may wanna take different approaches with your IP strategy over time as the business evolves, expands to new markets, adds products or services, or steps back and retrenches from certain areas. And also as your cash flow situation changes. For example, a pre-revenue startup may choose to protect their black box inventions by safeguarding them as trade secrets. Until they've tested market traction in, in different places and have uh, the financial means to patent in countries with the most potential. So this is a very busy slide, but uh, don't worry, we'll take it step by step. So this is not a complete list of possible approaches or tactics for an IP strategy, but it does cover the more uh, common approaches. The first one is protecting uh, technical aspects. And that can mean getting a patent to shut competitors out. One single solid broad patent can be effective strategy for a product that can be reverse engineered and will have a long enough lifespan to justify investing in patenting, monitoring and enforcement. This first approach also means protecting your trade secrets for things uh, not easily reverse engineered uh, and protecting them like your business depends on it because it does. Second, when you want to register, sorry, you want to capitalize on brand recognition and the value of a loyal customer base, register your trademarks and remember to renew them every 10 years. The third approach is to protect your IP for outward or offensive purposes. This is when you plan to aggressively enforce your right against competitors and copyrights. Next, you can protect your IP for defensive purposes, where you rely on your formal IP as a deterrent to others. If a competitor comes after you, you're prepared to counter sue, or maybe you can cross license each other's IP or collaborate, develop new stuff together and both come out ahead. <clears throat> the fifth approach. So this is using a combination of IP rights and it, it's typically for the folks that uh, have the deep pockets. So this is when you invest in layers of IP protection uh, for both defensive and offensive purposes. For example, getting a patent, registering trademarks and industrial designs, plus maintaining some know-how as trade secrets. <clears throat> Whether you go this route depends on budget and lifespan of the product or service, as well as the degree of competition in the sector and your budget. <clears throat> so the sixth <clears throat> possible approach uh, this is when you want to take an open innovation approach. <clears throat> so you deliberately do not protect your IP to exclude others. Instead, you can share it freely or license it at low cost or simply let it be copied. If your solution will have a short lifespan in the marketplace, why invest in a 20 year patent when you can plow that money into product development and marketing uh, to try and get that first mover advantage? <clears throat> Copyrights will come out of the woodwork, but when they do, you're already on to something else. <clears throat> so open innovation can also work if what you offer provides superior value over your competitors and makes your customers super loyal. Uh, this approach worked quite well for Shopify and their particular software as a service model. They intentionally did not hold patents until recently when their business expanded. <clears throat> and in doing so, put them in direct competition with Amazon because they got into warehouse um, inventory and shipping logistics. So when they bought out uh, this other company, it came with their patent portfolio. Uh, so the, the two links at the bottom uh, go into a little more information on how Shopify has evolved their IP strategy over time. Another situation where this open innovation approach can work is if you're playing a long game in an emerging area and you're hoping to set national or global standards that others will follow, 
open innovation can help you get there. Apple's a really good example in how they licensed their uh, code to app developers for free for, to then create demand for iPhones. Or maybe you publish the first chapter of your book or a few songs from a CD to entice customers to buy the whole book or concert tickets and expensive swag. So next we'll look at uh, eight tips. <clears throat> so like a business plan, you should not outsource development of your IP strategy. Uh, we recommend that you build a plan that you can and will implement. As you go through IP, as you go through CEPL's IP inventory checklist, and I, I put a link in the, uh, the chat, as you go through that, that inventory checklist, be sure to identify any third-party IP that you use and whether you have a license or the permission to use it. I'm sure everyone has many priorities today. Uh, so if you do plan to just keep this deck in my contact info for future reference, I'm good with that. But please do one thing today. Click on that inventory checklist and go through it. It's, uh, it's only one pager. Uh, so we do recommend that you seek advice from an IP professional, particularly if you have your site set on foreign markets. They'll help you with the details of how you implement your strategy and steer you clear of legal pitfalls. And many of them will have an initial meeting with a prospective client for free to help you understand their areas of expertise and their service fee structure and whether they bill by the hour or could perhaps offer a fixed price service. So SIPO, uh, our fact sheet on how to find the right IP professional for you uh, also has a very rough range of what, can, what it can cost. And that fact sheet, I'll show you a visual uh, towards the end. You'll also want to determine if you have the legal right to use all the IP connected to your competitive advantage. So do this for each country that you plan to do business in and assess the relative strength and scope of your protection in each market, because it may not be the same everywhere, and this could influence your choice of markets, as well as the sequence of how you file your applications. Obtaining a freedom to operate, essential, uh, freedom to operate assessment is essentially a legal opinion, and doing so uh, before you go to market and before you launch, please, please, um, this is an essential step uh, and a big part of your risk management plan, uh, because the last thing that you want to do is infringe on someone else's rights and then have them come after you as you're just getting out of the gates. Uh, so that's, that's how the freedom to operate assessment can help you succeed. Uh, you, you'll also want to outline the business practices and contracts that you've put in place to ensure that ownership of IP stays with your firm and that your expectations around handling and disclosure of IP is very clear among your employees, contractors, partners, and investors. If you're going to collaborate uh, with third parties and do uh, joint R&D, make sure that ownership of the IP uh, each player brings to the table, what we call foreground IP, as well as the IP that results from the collaboration, um, the foreground, sorry, the stuff that you bring to the table, that's your background IP. <clears throat> what you develop together is your foreground IP. So put down your expectations around who owns it, uh, how it can be used and whether it can be disclosed. Uh, next on the topic of budgeting, it's no secret that obtaining IP rights can be costly. And the truth is that obtaining those rights is the beginning of an IP journey. So what's the point of investing effort and expense of getting a patent, <clears throat> for example, if you're not prepared to enforce it? It's really important to budget resources you'll need to monitor the marketplace, to detect infringement, and also to enforce your IP rights to stop others from stealing it. So in a practical um, sense, defending IP rights can range from providing notice about suspected infringement to sending a cease and desist letter to negotiating a licensing deal or a long and expensive lawsuit. Uh, finally, remember to integrate your IP strategy into your overall business plan. So there's visibility and coherence with your financial, HR, operational, and your marketing plans. 
we also recommend updating your strategy uh, from time to time as your business evolves. Also, um, check in on your competitors. Have they expanded coverage of any of their IP or have they bought a, bought a firm or moved into new, uh, new niches? <clears throat> so here's the link to our online uh, IP strategy planning tool. It's free to use as are all of our resources. Now, <clears throat> it won't spit out a, an IP strategy for you, but it will walk you through the important uh, steps and areas to cover uh, and choices you'll need to make as you build your strategy. It'll also help you have productive conversations with your leadership team, investors, and IP professionals. Okay, we're on the, uh, close to the end here. <clears throat> Hopefully my voice will last. <laughs> um, so um, I'd like to just point you to uh, CPO's free resources learning tools, uh, starting from our landing page at canada.ca slash CPO. And I'm also gonna mention a great provincial resource uh, for Saskatchewan-based innovators. And this is the Saskatchewan Commercial Innovation Incentive, or what is also called a patent box. Although other forms of IP are recognized under this program, including plant breeders' rights, trade secrets, and copyrights. So the incentive is essentially a reduction in your provincial corporate income tax rate when you commercialize IP within the province. So this will take you to our online IP toolbox and loads of fact sheets, including uh, ones for the types of IP we covered today. And the one in the lower right, that's the one to help you um, know how to choose the right patent agent or trademark agent or um, IP lawyer for, for what you need. Under the resources tab in that IP toolbox is where you'll find a number of success stories with loads of embedded know-how uh, from Canadian companies and how they leverage their IP here and abroad. Companies like Solus, which I mentioned earlier, uh, DNA Genetech, Carbon Cure, Lee Valley Tools, Arcteryx, Lululemon, and there's, there's more and more. It seems like every week we're adding a, a new success story. So still within the IP toolbox, if you click on the exporting tab, <clears throat> That's where you'll find our series of country guides on how to protect your IP abroad. And we develop these together with the Global Affairs Canada people. Um, you may also be interested to know that the IP advisors have uh, personal networks across federal government and some uh, provincial and even municipal resources as well. So if you become a client, we can make warm introductions uh, to our colleagues in the Trade Commissioner Service with IRAPs, um, industrial technology advisors, the program managers at Western Diversification, the innovation advisors, um, and also the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises people. And they're part of uh, what used to be known as Public Works. It's now PSPC. Uh, please don't ask me to, <laughs> to explain that acronym. Um, in any case, the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises or OSME, these are the folks that facilitate government procurement for small and medium enterprises and they're very resourceful folks to, uh, to get to know as well. Um, we know the market development specialist at Agriculture Canada, and we'll be happy to uh, make introductions there as well. Now, these are our, uh, our e-learning modules, and I have to say they're slick. Uh, they have excellent content, and they each take only around half an hour uh, to go through. So if anyone's keen to learn more, Right after this, I'd, I'd start in the IP Academy and go to our e-learning e modules. So uh, lots of ways to get in touch. You can reach us online, through social media, or by connecting with me uh, over email, please. People can also call our Client Service Center uh, for help searching the patent database, the trademark copyrights or industrial design databases also as part of your preliminary uh, search of prior art or to check the status of an application. Uh, these are among the many things that our um, uh, experts in the client service center can help with. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen, go look at the chat and, and the, 
and the Q&As. But just before I do, um, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And uh, I also would like to wish you a happy early uh, Women's Entrepreneurship Day uh, tomorrow. It says Alberta, but I believe it's, uh, it's Canada-wide. Alrighty. I'm gonna switch modes. So in the Q&A, can I say a bit more about the commercial IP resource in Saskatchewan and how there might be a tax incentive? Um, I learned about it only yesterday as I was doing my research. So the best thing to do would simply do an internet search for Saskatchewan commercial, uh, Saskatchewan patent box, I think is how I first found it. Okay, now turning to the chat, there's a little more going on there. Um, if anyone has a question and you're able to unmute your mic, please go ahead. So the questions are all through the chat box or that, that Q&A, Marnie. There's no um, audio privileges for this platform. Um, okay. But if you do have any questions, yes, please feel free to hop over to that Q&A box and type them in there. Alrighty, and while that's happening, I'll go through the chat. Myers Briggs practitioner, speaker, teacher, and career coach. Cool. Fashion designer. We talked about uh, industrial designs and um, possibly the WIPO. Uh, proof token for your early early designs if you're wanting to have a record uh, of them. Founder of a tech company. Um, yeah, the whole gamut of, of IP, um, aside from plant breeders' rights, depending on what sector you're in these days. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Acastings, my husband and I invented an agricultural part and have started a business around it. We have utility and design patents underway in Canada and internationally. Fantastic, Krissa. Um, if you have any either lessons learned, horror stories, experienced or positive experiences, um, feel free to, to share those in, uh, in the chat for others to learn from as well. I'll sometimes partner up with a patent agent and have them come in and give examples um, of horror stories and near misses and, uh, and lessons, <clears throat> pardon me, lessons learned. <clears throat> Josie, you, you tell me if we're losing people <clears throat> or if there's a question I ought to focus on. It looks like Jolene has kind of an expansion on her question in, in the Q&A box there, if you want to take a look at that. And then I will maybe close things off once you're done with that question there. Okay. If, if, <clears throat> pardon me. If there's a way we could save the questions and forward them to me, I'll have another look uh, later today. When this was helpful. Chris Veronique. I'm not seeing the expansion. Oh, just in the Q&A box there, Jolene says, my question was more about what disclaimers to use with handouts and PowerPoints in terms of them not photocopying and redistributing materials. Ah, okay. Thanks, Josie. So uh, Jolene, best practice here is to use a copyright notice on your materials. Um, go to our IP toolbox, find the fact sheet on copyrights and on the bottom right of that one pager, you'll see the example of a copyright notice. So the C in a circle, who owns it, your name, if it's different, and the year. Um, and also, if anyone has a website, ensure that you, use your, your, that you have a copyright notice on, on it and any of your original materials. Uh, also, best practice, make sure you're not infringing someone else's uh, copyrights if you're borrowing photos or uh, written materials, et cetera. Can I provide average cost to trademark, patent, and copyright? There's really no such thing uh, as an average. Our fact sheet on hiring an IP prof professional gives a very, very, very rough range. Um, but the reality is it depends on what technology sector you're in, um, how many countries you're targeting, and, and how 
yeah, how competitive the sector is already. So if, if it's very uh, full of many, many patents, it might be a bit trickier to, 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 to scope out an area for you to specialize in uh, versus if you have a truly transformational um, invention in, let's see, a new, a new sector um, where you're, you're um, sort of the first to, you know, develop uh, some kind of like platform technology that will just take off um, will all uh, affect the average costs. Um, as for the government fees, also have a look at our at our uh, fact sheets. They indicate um, the fees that CPO charges. And it's sometimes good to compare that to what um, someone like a trademark agent or a patent agent will, will charge you to do that part for you. And you may want to uh, do some of your own upfront work if, uh, if that's helpful. So Karen, developing an app to support a service I offer. And there will likely be a subscription after papers are being published about uh, Karen, get in touch uh, individually over, over email. Um, I, I have a few pointers I can offer. I also have a colleague um, with a great deal of experience in this area and I'd be happy to uh, loop her in as well. Um, so there are only seven IP advisors such as myself, but we, we work together and we share information and we have access to uh, professionals um, in across the field of IP as well. Can training courses be trademarked? Um, I I'm not going to say no, I don't know enough about the Trademark Act, but certainly you may want to consider uh, copywriting. That means using the copyright notice on your materials and also registering your copyrights uh, online. It's not mandatory to do that, but it only costs 50 bucks to register your copyrights in Canada and you will get an official certificate of ownership. So if you wind up in court one day and you've got the certificate of ownership, um, the onus will be on your competitor to, uh, to make their case. And for more info on that, uh, go into our IP toolbox, find the copyright fact sheet, or go to canada.ca slash copyrights. Okay, no open questions. Uh, again, apologies if I've missed anyone. I'm not as adept at this multitasking as I'd like to be, but I, I'll do my best to get uh, to get back to get to people individually um, with any questions. Okay, Josie, back over to you. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Marnie, for the great presentation today. I think there's a lot of resources that we'll all find helpful. Um, and like you mentioned, we will be distributing that slide deck and the, rec and the recording tomorrow um, at about this time. And you'll also be able to find this recording always on our small business resources page. So be sure to check there. Um, I'll also quickly mention while we're on the topic of IP, uh, we do have a legal series starting on December 2nd and running all through January. And one of these topics is actually around the legal side of IP, trademarks, uh, business name registration, that, that kind of thing. So if you are interested in, in this or any of the other legal topics, be sure to keep checking our website. We should have details on those January webinars posted in early December. Uh, so I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great Women's Entrepreneurship Day tomorrow as well. We'll be celebrating that over here. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us.